behind-the-scenes action right there. Okay, I want to welcome everyone to um, Bethel Church this morning. It's a hot one out there, so I hope everyone's keeping cool. It's cool in here, and we wanted to let you know that Bethel is an inclusive faith community seeking to transform lives by exemplifying the unconditional love of Jesus. We extend a cordial and heartfelt welcome to all who join us in worship today in person, via Zoom, or live stream. Welcome to those new to the Christian faith and those who are longtime followers of Christ, as well as those without a church home, and to those visiting friends with friends and family from other faith communities. To those who need strength and want to follow Jesus Christ, have doubts, or do not yet believe. To people of every color, culture, sexual orientation, gender identification, economic background, age, size, ability, and, ch and challenges, old friends and new guests. To the old, to the, to the young, the believers and questioners and questioning believers, we welcome you to worship God with us on this day. So just take a moment, center yourself, and let the Lord into your heart today. Um, and may the peace of the Lord God be with each and every one of you.
And the next one we're going to do is I Believe. And you can find that alphabetical order in your books. <laughs> that delay. I was sick this week and forgot all my responsibilities. So here we go. This is um, John 11 through John 11 verses 1 through are we going 43? 44. 20, 26. 1 through 26. A man was sick, Lazarus of, of Bethany, 
the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who managed the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, this sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But oddly, when, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was for two more days. After the two days, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. They said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you and you're going back? Jesus replied, Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, when Jesus finally got there, it, okay, I am so sorry, I lost my place. And uh, I said, he said, I know, I just, <laughs> um, uh, what was the last play? I, I, Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going so that I may wake him. We're going to verse what? 26. Uh, if he's fallen asleep, Master, he will get well. So oh, that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> they, however, supposed that he was speak, speaking of natural sleep. Then he said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. And what verse are you? Uh, are you? I'm at verse 12. Mm -hmm. Okay, if uh, if you just stop at actually, you have to say nobody can hear at home mm -hmm. what she's saying. You have to. Say I know it. that's why I tried, wanted to go back, but I can't because that uh, I can't scroll on this because it's so slides. Oh, I realize. Okay, go back. Go back <laughs> I'm sorry because I uh, I was reading off the slide. Mm -hmm. There we go. We got it back on there. Okay, um, so you stopped at verse 15, so I'm gonna go right there. Okay. Um, and I'm glad for your sakes, sakes that I was not there, so that you may learn to believe in me. But let us go to him. At this, Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go too, so that we may die with him. When Jesus reached the place, he found that Lazarus had been four days in the tomb already, Bethany being only about two miles from J Jerusalem. A number of the people had come there to comfort Martha and Mary because of their brother's death. And when Martha heard that Jesus was, was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat quietly at home. Master, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now, I know that God will grant you whatever you ask of him. Your brother will rise to life, said Jesus, and know that he will, replied Martha, in the resurrection at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life, said Jesus. He who believes in me will live, though he, though he die. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This ends the reading. Thankfully, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Sorry about that. Thank you, God. It's good to be back, and it's good to know that we're all human. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's really good. So thank you. At this time, we're going to uh, allow the children to go with Julia to uh, the time of the children's service. And thank you, Julia, for taking care of that. Thank you for all your volunteers. And welcome. We want to welcome you to our worship service and just invite you to pray with me today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer, God of life. Renew and restore us to new life. 
leaving in the grave all that prevents us from living and loving you and others fully. Amen. It's, uh, it's an idiom that has been used for decades, and the Urban Dictionary says it like this. It's like if a person likes you but is really afraid to tell you that they like you, and then another person asks you out instead, and so you say to the first person that they waited and missed out. So you say to them, sorry, you are a day late and a dollar short. And a dollar short. <laughs> or said another way, too little, too late. When a person is a day late and a dollar short, they missed an opportunity due to delay, and they missed an opportunity because they really didn't put forth enough effort, not enough or too late, and they weren't prepared. And today I want to use the story about Lazarus to preach from the subject four days late, but right on time. Hmm. Four days late, but right on time. Here's the spoiler alert. As a listener, you will notice that I do not answer the question of why Jesus did not heal Lazarus before he died. But I do raise some other questions that troubled me and made me wonder as I was studying the test. The, the, the narrative of Na Lazarus is, is really rich in literary and scriptural themes interwoven with what has happened already in the Gospel of John and what is to come. The account is placed in the Gospel of John right before, right after the Good Shepherd sermon and right before the anointing and the final entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's really a crucial point in the plot that lifts up some central theological themes in the Gospel of John. John, which is intended to prove conclusively that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why John wrote this gospel, to prove that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing in Jesus, you will have eternal life. Amen. That's what John is writing for. Now, a key verse or key verses in the gospel of John is John, the 20th chapter, verse 31, 30 and 31. And it says, Jesus did many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. But these signs and these miracles are written so that you might what? You might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that in believing, you will have eternal life. So that's kind of the backdrop of this story. Lazarus was sick and Lazarus is dying and his sisters, Mary and Martha, are frantic. And based on their experience with Jesus before, they believed that only Jesus were here. He healed our brother. Jesus was informed of the urgency of the situation, but Jesus doesn't come, which led them to wonder. Doesn't Jesus know about our crisis? Isn't he supposed to be omniscient? Didn't he get our message? Or maybe he's just too busy. He doesn't care. Or it's just that Jesus really can't help us. After all, when we want a breakthrough, when we want a miracle, we want Jesus or God to act and do it right now. When we need healing, when we're confronted with difficult situations, we want God to fix it. Not next month, not next week. We want God to fix it today. But sometimes we cry out to God, I'm being troubled right here and right now, come and help. And what we find is we find ourselves in God's waiting room without an appointment. The divine seems now sometimes, and just as the divine appeared back then, four days late. As we examine this story, I want us to see if there are any lessons that we can take from this story and apply to our life today. As I look at three points, God's timing, 
versus our timing. God's timing versus our timing. Is, is time as we know and understand it a factor with the infinite God? Is time as we know and understand it a factor with an eternal being that scripture describes as dwelling in a different realm beyond the perception of our physical senses and really not limited to the physical laws that control and restrict you and I? Is it possible for us to really understand this idea of eternity? Or is it possible for us to understand this really idea of timelessness, of a divine being? I made the mistake of uh, attending a conference with, uh, well, I don't know that it was a mistake, but I had the pleasure of attending a conference with, with Rebecca and a bunch of other really educated philosophers. And I was just there, my head was just twisting and turning as they were talking about this whole concept of time. Do we in our finite minds try to confine an infinite being based on our schedule and our understanding of time? If you remember correctly, according to some theories of physics, the universe is a fixed block where time only appears to pass. And the passage of time, according to physics, is an illusion because time is property resulting from the existence of matter. And we humans want, we expect, and we sometimes feel that we are entitled to have things quick, immediate, now, microwave, faster and faster, computers and shortcuts. We, we hate delays. We hate long lines in the supermarket. We hate stop signs and stoplights. We hate train crossings and slow trucks and being put on hold. We even hate being placed in the Zoom waiting room. So it should come as no surprise that we, when we pray, we expect God to move it right now. Mm -hmm. But Second Peter chapter three, verse eight says that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Maybe as humans, we have a finite perspective and limited view. God's timing is always at odds with us because of our finite perspective and our limited view. One of Dr. Chan's colleagues, Professor Ajume, tells the story of waiting for a train in Africa and the train was scheduled to depart the station at 845. And so Professor Ajume was scheduled, uh, went there early to, to wait for the train. And, and, and as the professor was waiting for the train, the professor looked and he said, it's 851, no train, 905, and then no train, 915, and still no train. So no one around him in the train station seemed to be bothered by this at all. And he's getting increasingly perplexed. Finally, he approaches the ticket agent at the counter and says, the train is supposed to depart at 845, right? And it's already 915. Where's the train? The person at the counter looks at him and says, yes, it's an 845 train and it's not here. And that means it's not 845. <laughs> Professor Jume said, what type of logic is this? I've been in America too long and I don't do CP time. If you don't know what <laughs> CP time is, you gotta ask somebody. Mary and Martha waited. Jesus didn't come in their time and Lazarus died. And so from their perspective, Jesus was four days late because Jesus didn't arrive at the time that they expected Jesus to arrive. God's timing versus our timing. And second point is delay is not denial. We live in a culture of impatience, Instagram, instant gratification, hmm. 
Instant gratification refers to that human desire to experience fulfillment without delay or without ever waiting. IG, instant gratification, applies to a whole lot of things in our life. Just think about it. You can get about anything instantly today. Food, flowers, furniture, and fresh, clean laundry. No longer do we search through volumes of books to obtain information. You have a question? Just ask Siri, Alexa, or Google. You have your answer in seconds. No delay, no waiting. We don't like being delayed. We have become accustomed to instant gratification afforded to us by technology. So we will yell at our iPads and our iPhones and our laptops when they freeze. We yell at our computers. We take out our frustrations on the Amazon customer service representative who put us on hold while they research a package that hasn't arrived that we would have had sit for three days before we opened it, but we wanted it overnight anyway. That's right. Amazon, FedEx, and UPS tells us that waiting an extra day for a delivery is an eternity and it's really unacceptable in today's instant gratification society. And so sometimes our impatience carries over into our faith life. When there is a delay in a reply for something you and I have prayed about, we can be tempted to think that the answer is no, when the answer might just be wait. Mm -hmm. We believe the response is never when it might just be not yet or not now, because for many of us, delay is dreadful. Delay is disastrous. Delay is devastating. Delay equals denial. But I've had situations in my life where I have benefited from delay, where a delay has helped and not hurt me when I was shopping for a motor vehicle. Delay was good. When I was shopping for a mortgage, when I was shopping for a ministry opportunity, when I was shopping for a marriage partner. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> Delay can be good sometimes. <laughs> One of the most troubling parts of this story is in verse 6, which describes the response of Jesus to the request of Mary and Martha after being informed of the failing health of Lazarus, we would expect Jesus to, to run to their side. We would expect Jesus to run to Lazarus's aid, but instead the text records Jesus being indifferent, unsympathetic, uncaring, and appeared to be unconcerned about their cry for help. To add insult to injury, the text goes on to say that after hearing of Lazarus's condition, Jesus stayed over an extra two days in the city where he was at. And so upon his arrival four days later, we can understand the anguished cries of Mary and Martha who greet Jesus separately, but with the same words, Lord, if you had been here. I know that all of us here are too holy to have ever uttered those words, but maybe we know someone who said it. Lord, if you'd been here, fill in the blank. If you'd been here, this would not have happened. If you'd been here, this situation would have turned out differently than it did. Lord, if you had been here, implied in this statement are some critical questions and perhaps even accusations. Where were you, Jesus? Why did you take so long to get here? I thought you loved my brother. I thought you cared about us. And even the friends and the neighbors who were gathered to support Mary and Martha in the death of their brother begin to question, couldn't this Jesus who released captives and unstopped dead ears and caused the lame to walk and opened the blinded eyes, 
had kept Lazarus from dying? You see, these are the kind of questions that we ask, or these are the kind of questions we would like to ask when we're faced with tragedy. Where is God? How could God have let this happen to me? Couldn't you have prevented all of this horrible pain and this heartache that I'm feeling? Has there ever been a time in your life experience when you cried out to God? God, things are really getting bad. It can't get any worse. I would maintain that some of us are crying out and weeping right now. The recent decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court and the other constitutional rights we all fear might now be threatened. God, where are you? Daily news of another mass shooting, inflation, poverty, homelessness, hate crimes, and racism all seem to be on steroids. God, where are you? More power-hungry men who start wars and destroy families and ruin hopes and dreams just because they can. God, where are you? Many people today are crying out, Lord, do something. Help. But God appears to say nothing. God appears to be absent. God appears to be aloof, uninterested, and unconcerned. And I will admit to you, at these times, it's hard to trust. It's hard to believe. It's hard to wait. We appeal to the highest court in the land, and the court refuses to hear our case. Mm -hmm. And at times like these, it's hard to hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. You see, at these crossroads, it can be challenging to understand or even accept or believe in the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. But I've discovered, and I've even experienced in my life and on my faith journey, that sometimes I just don't get the answers for all of the questions that I'm asked. And the same thing was true of Mary and Martha in the tent. Jesus doesn't explain to Mary and Martha or the neighbors why he didn't come sooner or why he didn't prevent Lazarus from dying in the first place. But it seems that Jesus is still with them in their pain. It seems that Jesus is still with them in their death and deeply moved by their grief. You see, John doesn't report a verbal response between Jesus and Mary, but he does tell us that when Jesus saw Mary and Martha and the Jews who had come to comfort them, Jesus was greatly disturbed. He was disturbed in his spirit and he was moved in his heart. Then after asking, where is Lazarus? The text goes on to say that Jesus wept. I often wonder in situations like these if there could be dimensions of the problems or the concerns that we face in our life that we can't even imagine and we can't even see. We can't conceive. Significantly, it's important to point out that Jesus doesn't rebuke Mary and Martha or their friends for what they say. But instead, when Jesus comes to the the tomb, Jesus says, take the stone away. There's so many good preaching points <laughs> in this text. <laughs> Roll it away. Roll the stone away. That, I mean, if I had a long time, I could expand on that. Martha, Martha seems to be confused. Even though earlier in the passage, she declared that God would give Jesus anything that Jesus prayed for. Martha isn't really confident that Jesus knows what he's doing. Does Jesus really understand death? Lord, there is already a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus appears undaunted by the stench of death. And so after the stone is taken away, Jesus calls 
the dead brother by his name. It's important. Jesus calls him by his name. Now, in, in the church that I grew up in, the pastors would take liberty on this particular point and said Jesus had to be specific because if Jesus said, if Jesus had only said, arise, everyone who was dead would have come up from the grave. <laughs> I don't know. But if you look at the story itself, Lazarus is called everything but his name in the text. He whom you love. My brother. Stinky. <laughs> He's called everything but his name. But when Jesus shows up, Jesus calls him by his name. Lazarus. Come out. In the Hebrew, Lazarus means assistance of God. In the Greek, Lazarus means God is my help. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, I suppose, with his grave clothes still on, wrapped around his body and possibly around his face, he exits the tomb and Jesus says to him, here's another good preaching point, unbind him and let him go. What, what, what kind of things have you and I bound in grave clothes? You don't have to tell me because I ain't going to tell you, but what kind of things have you bound, wrapped up? Unbind him and let him go. Jesus appeared so slow in coming and it seemed as if he was too late. But even though we discovered that Jesus was four days late, the text seems to suggest that Jesus was right on time. Even when we are convinced all is lost. When we are ready to concede to the power of death, Jesus demonstrates that there is no loss, there is no tragedy, there is no power in heaven or in earth that can stand between you and God's love. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. I think much of the time it feels like death has been, it doesn't feel like death has been defeated. And like Mary and Martha, we cry out in pain. And we ask the agonizing questions about our job, about our children, about our relationships, about our partners, about chronic illness, about death, loved ones, and wars, and about gun violence. We ask these questions all the time. But even as we cry out of the depths, we live with hope. Hope. Yeah. Like Martha and Mary, we often discover that God doesn't act strictly when, where, or how we think God should act. But God will act in God's time. And even death will not be the final word. So, so maybe waiting and maybe trusting that behind the scenes, something is at work is an approach for you and I to consider. Mm -hmm. Because delay is not denied. Last point, there is a blessing in waiting. Isaiah tells us in the 40th chapter, in the 30 verse, 31st verse, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting Father, the creator of the universe, never sleeps or never slumbers? And goes on to say, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings as eagles, shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. We hate it. We want to hurry up. So why do we have to wait? I think waiting sometimes helps us learn patience and endurance. Waiting allows the divine to work in us for strength, for wisdom, for sympathy, for courage, for trust, for hope, so that we can comfort others who are also challenged by waiting. 
And sometimes in the delay, work is being done on our character. I think that Jesus had come when Lazarus was sick, Jesus would have just healed Lazarus. And that would have been a miracle in itself. But because Jesus came after Lazarus died, Jesus had to res resurrect Lazarus. Now, if you want to go theologically, this, this was symbolic in that it was demonstrating the resurrection of Jesus that would happen later right. on in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. But Jesus had to resurrect Jesus. And, and I think sometimes we need more than healing, we need resurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Resurrection from the dead thoughts. Resurrection from our dead dreams. Resurrection from dead politics. Resurrection from dead visions, from dead people. We need resurrection. Yes. I know that we're all different. Some people are more gun ho and action type. And while others may be more laid back and relaxed, I think I fall into the first camp. <laughs> so this idea of waiting around for God to do stuff has never really naturally warmed up with me. The process of waiting has never been inviting or enjoyable for me. Sometimes I, I get frustrated. Sometimes I lose patience. And, and I, sometimes I take the wrong steps because I'm in a rush and I end up throwing things away. I've, I've worked on patience most of my life, especially on being patient with me. But I read a quote this week which says, patience is not simply the ability to wait, but it's how you and I wait that matters. So I'm going to give you in closing some possibilities. We can wait pessimistically and think that things will never get any better. I don't know that that's any help. We can wait petulantly, stomping our feet. I'm not going to do it. None of us have ever done that, right? <laughs> Impatiently. I don't know that that brings things to an end. We can wait patiently, knowing that this too will pass. And we can watch for the happenings behind the scene to unfold themselves to us with new hope. We can work diligently, actively, striving for good and purpose in our world, not just sitting by uselessly and passively anticipating God to come down and do stuff that we can do for ourselves. Waiting is difficult, really difficult, but it can bring forth a blessing. Jesus was four days late, but right on time. Amen. And I want to encourage someone on Zoom or any of you beautiful faces that I'm looking at here today, not to give up hope. Amen. Take a deep breath. I saw someone do that just now. Just take a deep breath. And exhale. Don't give up hope. Even when it seems impossible, the answer may not come until hope seems to be gone. The answer may not come when you and I wanted to, in the way that we wanted to, but don't give up hope. Because sometimes I think we have to come to the end of our old rope 
in order to experience the beginning of our new hope. Hmm. I'm going to say that one more time. And I want you to hold on to this this week. Sometimes we have to come to the end of our old rope in order to experience the beginning of our new hope. Let's pray. God, we thank you that hope never fails. And even in those situations in our life where it feels like you're not just a day late, but in Mary and Martha's situation, four days late, we pray that you will Give us the courage and the strength that we need to never give up hope. Amen. We're going to be doing Rise Up, which is alphabetical order in your book.
come to that point in our worship service where um, you have an opportunity if you're able or you choose to support this ministry here at Bethel. We are forever grateful for those who support us financially, for those who volunteer of their time and talents to help make this service happen and ministry happen in the community, and for those who use their gifts outside of our setting here to minister to the needs of our sisters and brothers. So if you would like to give on the screen, they will show you a way that you could text and get a secure site to give. You can do the old fashioned way of either putting something in the basket in the back for those who are here or mailing a check. But we're grateful for you for any way that you choose to support this ministry here. And we thank you in advance for your gifts of your time your talents, and your treasures. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, give back in gratitude for all of the blessings that you have poured into our life. And we know that we cannot put a value, a monetary value on what it means to wake up and be healthy and to have food to eat and have loved ones in our life. And, but we, we try to demonstrate our appreciation by sharing of our time and our talents and our, our treasures and helping others. And so we pray blessings on those who are able to give and those who desire to give but do not have to give, that you will continue to open doors for all of us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we're continuing together in prayer and i have a prepared prayer and then we'll take any prayer requests or things that you want to bring to our attention together and then we'll finish with the lord's prayer god thank you for stories like that of lazarus mary and martha and there's so many things we can notice we definitely relate to Martha, who meets you on the road and says, where were you? We felt that way too, God. When the marriage couldn't be held together any longer, when the loved one died, when despairing grew past the tipping point, when the illness endured longer than was bearable, where were you? Even now, with bombs landing, leaders without enough conscience, good people suffering, coral reefs dying, where are you? We confess this to you, God, when we're feeling like we want you to step in and transform the situation, we can easily miss that you are here. I don't believe that you're up there in heaven with a giant chessboard carrying out your cosmic will with each of our heartbreaks. No, you're here. You're in our midst. You're going through the pain with us, sitting in the waiting space awaiting the results, pacing and wringing your hands with us, feeling the impotency and despair. Your love is great enough that you're willing to go through the grief with us, not from a distant objectivity, but rather a right here in the maddening, just barely manageable feelings of it all. God, may we notice you here with us, present powerfully in our midst, and may we realize that you give us ability capacity, the agency to act, the will to wait. It's my prayer that in the midst of pain, we sense your presence with us, that more of our where were you's may develop into, oh, you are here. Amen. I wonder what things you might want to share with each other that we can lift up. And then especially when we were um, on Zoom, it felt like it was hard to be connected. And so um, whether you're at home on Zoom or here, I invite you that you may want to lift your hands and respond with Lord, hear our prayer after somebody shares. I have a prayer of gratitude. Uh, Emily and I are, are celebrating our anniversary today. I think it's 17 years. <laughs> I don't know. I've lost count. So. Not a while. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, for those who couldn't hear, the Iatakos are celebrating their anniversary. Looks like it might be number 17. Um, Lord, 
Here are prayers. Thank you, God. prayers for the unhoused and our ministry and all of these families, um, that they can be lifted up and have moments of joy and peace even in their circumstances. Lord, Lord, Lord hear your prayers. prayers. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, ask for continued prayers for those uh, amongst our uh, friends and our family who are sick and uh, you know, grappling with illness, uh, in particular for Lisa Kelly, uh, who still has COVID and uh, she couldn't be here today to sing with us, uh, but we're praying for her full and total recovery. Um, also uh, for Louise, uh, who is still having challenges and you know is, is in a lot of pain. We pray for her absolute uh, full healing, dear God. Yeah. Uh, sorry. And Peter. And Peter also, who had, had got injured exactly, has uh, broke his leg, um, dear God. We pray for full healing for these members of our family here and uh, also uh, for my friend Barry, um, who is in his third round of uh, chemo for uh, cancer right now over at UCLA Santa Monica Hospital and yeah. just uh, really struggling. I think we ask, dear God, if it is your will, um, that you know, send a miracle uh, and uh, we praise you. All right. In case folks weren't able to hear at home. So prayers for Lisa and others who are struggling with COVID that they can recover fully. Um, also for Louise, our dear Louise, who needs some more healing, some more strengthening. For Peter, who had a recent injury, we want to pray for him and his healing. Um, for Jim's friend Barry and others like him who are going through mm -hmm. chemo, and we pray that there would be, again, recovery and healing. We would wish for those things. Um, I'd also like to pray for Karen. Karen's away on a trip. Um, hope that her travels will be safe and that she'll learn a lot and enjoy a lot while she's there. Mm -hmm. Lord, 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 Lord. Uh, we have a prayer from Lisa Kelly as well. Uh, prayers of thanks for her mom's biopsy results coming back yes. negative. Amen. Amen. And also from Dawn, grateful um, there are denominations like ELCA and PCUSA that are willing to speak unpopular truth to the world. Um, PCUSA declaring Israel apathy due to their treatment of Palestinians. All right. So for, um, for the fact of when denominations are willing to speak and have a, a, a presence, um, so we're thankful for that. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. Also, and then also Lisa's mom. mom. Lord, Lord, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Um, from Linda, prayers of gratitude. Deborah is responding well to her cancer treatment. Amen. 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 Lord, 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 hear our prayer. prayer. We also have one from Carrie Lambert, a prayer for um, my son who is a victim to a money scam. Mm. Prayer that he gets the money back, which he has been saving towards college. Mm. Lord, 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 hear, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And maybe prayer for transformation for the hearts of those who cheat and make money off of other people. Yes, yes. yes. Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. I'd like to actually offer a prayer too for Ukraine, because I know um, Jiro's been so good about bringing it back up, and I am thinking about them all the time, especially with all this. I mean, it continues to go on months now, so I'm praying for the people of Ukraine and all those who suffer in war and violence. Yes, for all of those suffering all around the world from all the different angles and sides of war and violence. Lord, 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 Lord. gratitude for joy. Amen. 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 Lord, 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 for the bravery to feel it. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, let's continue with the Lord's Prayer. And always, as always, you are welcome to say whatever words you are familiar with. Um, so that I won't stumble so much, I have them written here, and they're on the screen for those of you who are on Zoom. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be your, your name, your, your kingdom come, come your, your will be done, on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, bread, and, and forgive, forgive us our sins, sins as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I know that we're about to lead into communion. Just want to say that in terms of being together, um, it's so delightful to be together with you and those who are on Zoom. 
And I realized that um, you may feel like, yeah, coming on Sundays, that's enough for me. It's it's enough connection. I'm good. But there may be others of, of you who wonder, like, how do I get integrated in this community at all? Or how do I get to know people? Um, well, it's just one small thing. But Karen and I are hosting an event at our house on the 29th. It's a Friday evening. Hopefully it won't be a million degrees. Um, <laughs> So we welcome everyone to come. That will be in the bulletin as well, but just wanted to make sure you know. And then there's also things happening midweek. And so if you want to know more, we can make sure that if you give your email um, that you get on the mailing list for the Bethel Light, and then that has more details in it. Well, we are at the point in our worship service where we will receive communion. So. I hope those of you who are worshiping with us via Zoom have those items that are meaningful to you so that you can join us in this sacrament. In the night in which you as betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for you, for you, and for you, the people of God. I invite you to come at this time. Let's pray. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have the freshness and healing power of this gift of grace. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and love towards each other. For the sake of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you all the strength you need to keep hope alive. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing Raise and Hallelujah.
Please join us.